Genovese crime family is widely known. Genovese crime family is widely known within law enforcement as the Ivy League of the underworld, the family that gets it right. Luckily, Luciano was the guy who really made the mob what it is today. Luciano was the boss. Vito Genovese was the power. Genovese was violent. He liked to have bodies in the street. He liked to have people thrown through windows and off roofs and knocked off. Frank Costello was the gambling czar of this country. Costello owned the judges. No judge in New York City was appointed without Costello saying okay. You have these two Vincent Gigantes. During the day, he was this disheveled person, disoriented, mumbling. But in the evening, he would get in a limousine with a driver, and they would take him up to the swanky midtown townhouse. This is the largest of the five New York organized crime families. It has hundreds of members, and it is extraordinarily powerful. Of all the legendary names in the history of the New York Mafia, including Gambino, Bonanno, Colombo, and Lucchese, one stands apart, Genovese. Even today, after government crackdowns and infighting have ended the mob's golden era, the Genovese family is down but not out. It continues to make millions every year through rackets ranging from labor corruption to extortion, to drug trafficking. Make no mistake about it. This is not a script for The Sopranos. This is the real thing. In April 2001, the FBI rounded up 45 reputed gangsters and associates, wise guys with names like Sammy Meatballs and Frank the Fish. The arrests were made with the help of an informant inside the Genovese crime family. The men who created the family would never have tolerated such disloyalty in their ranks. But of course, they came from another world. In the 1890s, three boys were born into three southern Italian families. These families didn't know one another, but they shared a common dream, making a better life for themselves in the new world. In time, the three boys would find each other on the bustling streets of New York City. Together, they would create their own dark version of the American dream, reshaping the criminal underworld in their own images. The first of these three boys was Charles Lucky Luciano, born Salvatore Lucania on November 24, 1897, in the Sicilian town of Lercara Fridi. He was the oldest of Antonio and Rosalia Lucania's four children. Salvatore's father, a sulfur miner, brought his family to New York in 1906. They moved into a Jewish section of Manhattan's Lower East Side. But the promise of a better life in America still seemed beyond young Salvatore's grasp. People like Luciano used to look around and think, this is not a future I want. Because wherever you look, were men with large families working 12 hours a day, six days a week, for 50 cents a day. Luciano didn't want to work with a pick and shovel. He said there are other ways to make money uh, without working hard if you use your wits. And that's what he decided to do. In 1910, Salvatore dropped out of school to work as a delivery boy for a hat maker. Someone induced him into becoming a messenger and carrying drugs, and he used to put the heroin in the hat boxes and then walk around that way. He heard the lure of the street at a very early age, at least by the age of 14. He by then had committed to a criminal life. He was out there doing small-time crimes, smoking opium, having a sex life of sorts. His mother was openly ashamed of him, and he began to call himself Charles Luciano instead of Salvador Lucania, and it was a way of somehow removing the stain uh, from the family. 
At the age of 18, Luciano was arrested for possession of heroin and sentenced to a year in prison. His parents did not visit him in jail. Charlie Luciano's father turned his back on him and disowned him and said, I, I cannot have a son. I don't want to have a son like you. So as far as I'm concerned, you're not my son anymore. Luciano soon started his own gang and recruited other young hoods from around East Harlem, including one named Frank Costello. Born Francesco Castiglia in the town of Loropoli on January 26, 1891, Costello was the youngest of Luigi and Maria Castiglia's six children. At the age of four, he and his family boarded a crowded passenger ship bound for America. Space was so tight on board that young Francesco spent most of the voyage inside a large cooking pot. His family settled in East Harlem, a neighborhood teeming with poor Italian immigrants. They opened a little grocery store in East Harlem, but they had great difficulty making it. His father was ineffectual. He really hated his father. Instead of his father, young Francesco came to admire the well-dressed men he saw on the street. Men from the old country who had brought with them the traditions of organized crime, secrecy, loyalty, and respect. If you looked around, there was a certain class of guy who didn't really go to work, but always had nice clothes, who didn't really come from any particular place of power from the government or a company, yet seemed to command respect. And those were the men of La Cosa Nostra, the made guys. Francesco dropped out of school when he was 13 to join a street gang. To sound less Italian, he changed his name to Frank Costello. At 17, Frank had his first brush with the law. He was arrested in the Bronx for assault and robbery. The charges were dismissed. You could see that he was a very sullen, tough kid. And there really was no marked difference between uh, uh, the man who became known as the Prime Minister of the Underworld and the uh, others uh, at that time of his life. He was just another hoodlum kid. In the fall of 1914, at the age of 23, Costello married a vivacious 15-year-old Jewish girl named Loretta Geigerman. A few months later, Frank was arrested for possession of a handgun. He was sentenced to a year in prison. After that, I don't think Frank Costello personally uh, ever carried a gun again. Uh, he decided to get ahead by using his head instead of violence. The third of these young Italian immigrants was Vito Genovese, born three days after Luciano, on November 27, 1897, in Rosalino, Italy, near Naples. He moved to New York with his family at the age of 16. The Genoveses settled in Queens, where Vito's father ran a small construction business. But Vito was drawn to the excitement of Manhattan and soon moved in with some relatives in Little Italy. Vito was a thug from the get-go. He was a crook from, uh, you know, from the day he was uh, able to walk his first steps. You know, Genovese was um, a street guy, a guy who was quick to use violence, murder, you know, the mob hit to settle an issue. Even as a boy, Vito had dreamed of joining the underworld. In 1917, the burly 20-year-old was arrested for the first time for carrying a gun. He was sentenced to 60 days in jail. Soon after, Genovese joined Costello and Charlie Luciano's gang. At the time, the New York underworld was dominated not by Italians, but by Jewish gangsters. Luciano's savvy business style attracted the attention of a notorious Jewish mobster, Arnold Rothstein, who was looking for promising young delinquents to run his criminal operations. Luciano was the first person in organized crime of Italian parentage who said, I will work with others. Two of his closest allies were Maya Lansky and Ben Siegel, two 
men of the Jewish faith. He said, I trust them. We work well together, we can make money. I don't care that they are not Italians. While Luciano and Costello gladly worked with Jewish gangsters, Genovese refused to do business with non-Italians. Peter Genovese, he used to say to Costello, Frank, what are we doing all these around? Costello would look at him and say, shut up, Vito. You're an immigrant yourself. Rothstein was a powerful mentor, but something even more powerful was about to reshape the New York underworld and present the three Italian boys with a golden opportunity. In 1920, prohibition went into effect. Prohibition gave the mob its financial base. It brought so much money into them that they were able to branch out into other areas. With Rothstein's guidance, the ambitious young Italians learned how to grease the right palms in New York's corrupt democratic machine known as Tammany Hall. With the right payoffs to politicians, police, and district attorneys, they could run their bootlegging operations with no interference. These were men who had very limited education, but they learned American politics very well. Uh, they learned that if you gave support, political contributions in cash, which could not be traced, uh, that you could get politicians, if elected to office, who would be beholden to you. Only one thing stood in the way of Luciano, Costello, and Genovese, the old Sicilian bosses, the men of respect, who still lorded over the Italian underworld. As prohibition turned into the biggest mob racket ever, the Sicilian bosses began fighting a bloody street war. Luciano worked for Joe the Boss Masseria. Masseria's rival, Salvatore Maranzano, wanted Luciano to work for him. When Lucky refused, it nearly cost him his life. He was picked up by four gangsters around 50th Street in New York City, and taken out and beaten and left for dead. And then they just dumped his body and he made his way back alive. And his friends, when they heard about it, I suppose have said, you were lucky to come out of that alive. And that's how he got the nickname Lucky, which stayed with him all of his days. The attack left Lucky with a droopy eyelid and a hideous scar across his chin. It also convinced him that the old bosses had to go. With help from his Jewish allies, Luciano arranged the murders of both Masseria and Maranzano. Now, in his moment of victory, Luciano decided to create an operation that was far more powerful than a street gang. A criminal empire that would be run like a business and put the organized in organized crime. By 1931, an ambitious young gangster named Lucky Luciano had killed off New York's two most powerful Italian dons. Now he was ready to change the face of organized crime. He called together all his young compatriots and rivals in New York's Italian underworld. Fellow immigrants like Carlo Gambino, Joe Bonanno, Tommy Lucchese, and Joe Profacci. He proposed that the city's rackets be divided among five crime families, with the boss of each family serving on a board of directors known as the Commission. The idea was to run everything as an absolute business-like proposition. Uh, no one had any exclusive control over any particular racket. And that if there were problems, people were not to pull out guns and start shooting one another. They would have come before this body, the commission, which then would issue a final decree. This gives the mafia a, a new national scope and a certain order and continuity that no other criminal gang has. The Irish and Jewish gangsters don't have a mafia, and then they don't have a commission to organize and make the mafia a bit more coherent. Though the bosses on the commission all had the same amount of power, Luciano would be the first among equals. Luciano had a certain quality of personal leadership. It wasn't that he was more violent than the other guys. They were all stone killers who loved to kill people and loved to tell war stories about it afterward. It wasn't that he was more dangerous. He was just somehow deferred to 
Luciano enlisted longtime associates Vito Genovese and Frank Costello to help run his own family. The thug Genovese would be in charge of the muscle, while the cunning Costello would manage the family's hold on Tammany Hall. Through gambling, narcotics, and extortion rackets, the family was soon bringing in more money than many large corporations. The Genovese crime family commanded great amounts of two of the principal things that made the wheels turn in New York at that time. One was uh, the threat of violence and the ability to command fear in men, and the other was tremendous amounts of money. At the age of 34, Lucky Luciano, who had come to America as a poor Sicilian immigrant, was New York City's most powerful gangster. He loved being Charlie Lucky Luciano, the number one gangster in town. And he liked to be seen and celebrated. He was always beautifully dressed, expensive cars, and jewelry, expensive women, expensive places. Luciano frequented New York hotspots like the Stork Club and rubbed elbows with movie stars, politicians, and beautiful women. The multimillionaire always carried a fat wad of cash to keep the party rolling. He lived um, in a very lavish style in a penthouse suite at the Waldorf Astoria. And it's almost as if he began to savor this kind of notoriety. And there were people around him who tried to warn him, Charlie, this is not smart. Once you make yourself that visible, you become a target. In 1935, a young assistant U.S. attorney named Thomas Dewey launched a crusade to weed out mob corruption in New York. Charles Lucky Luciano was his main target. Luciano was arrested on a trumped-up charge of profiting from prostitution. In 1936, he was found guilty and sentenced to 30 to 50 years in Dannemora Prison in upstate New York. He continued to run the family from his cell, but the day-to-day -day operations fell to his number two man, Vito Genovese. The rest of the gang regarded Vito as a thug. You know, he was a Neanderthal. Guys like Luciano, they were always trying to figure out a business angle. I don't make money on this. Vito's solution to every one of these problems, well, we'll just go in and we'll kill him. You knew, just from looking into his eyes, that he could destroy you without any regrets in a second and not think of it for more than a half a second after. It was the eyes of a killer, which he was. Genovese would stop at nothing to get what he wanted. Soon after his first wife died in 1931, he became interested in his 22-year-old cousin, Anna Patillo Vernatico. There was only one problem. Anna was already married. Vito's solution was simple. He had her husband killed, then married Anna two weeks later. And people like Costello would say to him, Vito, this is going to attract a lot of attention. Well, Vito would counter-argue, if you don't make people afraid of you, if they're not terrified of you, you're not going to have an effective criminal organization. But Vito's violent streak eventually caught up with him. In 1937, he left his wife behind in the States and fled to Italy to avoid a murder rap. With Vito gone, 46-year-old Frank Costello took over as boss of Lucky Luciano's crime family. Unlike Genovese, who was legendary for his temper and love of violence, Costello took a more civilized approach to his work. Costello was a soft-spoken man with a raspy voice, the result of an operation on his vocal cords. He thought that conflict just got in the way of making money. His ability to keep the peace between hot-headed gangsters earned him the nickname Prime Minister of the Underworld. Costello established what became the Trinity. It's really the template for modern organized crime. And the Trinity is you combine three things. Politics, business, and crime. All have to coexist and all have to work together. There was a time in New York, um, in the 40s and the 50s in particular, where you did not become a judge, 
uh, or a uh, district leader or anybody of any significance in New York City politics without getting Frank Costello's okay. He's a corrupter. Corruptors change us. When judges are bought, when police chiefs are bought, when people in government are bought, it changes our system of government. And it is much more dangerous, much more dangerous than uh, Vito Genovese, who merely kills. Despite his financial success, Costello was uneasy about his role as leader of the family. After all, he had become boss by default and never had much use for the rituals and politics of the Mafia. He knew he was highly regarded by the underworld, but what he really wanted was the public's respect. This was a quirk of his personality. He craved respectability, quiet respectability, not the respectability that comes with notoriety. Frank liked to think of himself as a cultured, intelligent, you know, man who could mix with almost anybody, which he, in fact, accomplished. He always viewed himself as a businessman, not as a gangster. I viewed him as a gangster, and I told him so. I said, Frank, you're a gangster who wears nice suits. Finally, in 1947, half a century before Tony Soprano, a depressed 56-year-old Costello did the unthinkable for a crime boss. He went to a psychiatrist, for God's sakes. And he saw the psychiatrist for two years. He felt that if he had had an opportunity to get some education, he would have not ended up in the mafia, but would have ended up uh, as senator. Costello Shrink told him to make new friends and start spending more time with nice people. But as Costello carved out a new social life for himself, an old nemesis was about to return. Before long, Costello would find not only his role as boss, but also his life in the crosshairs. By the late 1940s, Frank Costello had been boss of the Genovese crime family for the better part of a decade. Yet Costello also craved respect outside the mob. On the advice of his psychiatrist, he began spending more time with regular people and less time with other members of the Mafia. But while Costello was busy searching for inner peace, his rival, Vito Genovese, was gunning for a way to get back into the boss's chair. In 1946, after nearly 10 years as a fugitive in Italy, Genovese had been extradited to the U.S. to stand trial for the murder of a mob associate. But lo and behold, a strange thing happened. The chief witness against him suddenly turned up dead. <sighs> Who can explain? It's a mystery. But in any event, the murder case against him collapsed, and now he went back feet first into the American mafia. But he's no longer the number two man. He's not the number one man. He's just a capo, a, a lower level leader, which he deeply resented. And he harbored that resentment against Costello. But Genovese's ambition wasn't the only problem Costello faced. In 1951, he was called to testify before a congressional committee investigating organized crime. The committee grilled Costello about his activities. You must have in your mind some things you've done that you can speak of to your credit as an American citizen. If so, what are they? Paid by tax. His worst fear was realized, and it came to fruition during the Kafalva committee hearing when he was unmasked for what he was. You know, a mafia leader in disguise, uptown, you know, uh, who was really the uptown branch of the Cosa Nostra. Humiliated and angry, Costello walked out in the middle of his third day of testimony. He was charged with contempt and served 14 months in prison. Three years later, he was convicted of tax evasion, fined $30,000, and sentenced to five years. He was released on appeal after serving 11 months, but he knew his days as head of the family were numbered. 
Vito Genovese had made no secret of his desire to become boss. The violent Genovese was popular with the family muscle, the street thugs who did the dirty work, while the money men like Costello kept their hands clean. In the years while Vito Genovese was away, the men closest to him did not prosper under Costello, as well as others had. So he felt his men had been held down and held back, uh, and he was looking for vengeance. Genovese was now determined to knock off his longtime rival. To do the job, he turned to a trusted young lieutenant named Vincent Chin Giganti, a first-generation Italian-American. Vincent Giganti's rise to power uh, took the route that is the most popular in the Mafia. It's called the chauffeur route. If you really want to get ahead in the Mafia, at some point what you have to do, or most advisable to do, is to become chauffeur to the big boss. Giganti was chauffeur for Vito Genovese. Vincenzo Giganti was 31 years younger than his boss, Vito Genovese, but he grew up with the same ambition, to be rich and powerful. Giganti was born on March 29, 1928, in New York City. Like Luciano, Costello, and Genovese, Vincenzo was the son of Italian immigrants, the fourth of six sons born to Salvatore and Yolanda Giganti. His parents had settled in Greenwich Village and had never learned English. His father worked as a jewelry engraver and his mother was a seamstress. Vincenzo dropped out of high school at the age of 16 to pursue a boxing career. Giganti got the nickname Chin partially because his mother called him Vincenzo or Chinzo and because he had this distressing problem that when somebody socked him on the chin, he went unconscious, which is not a very good attribute for a boxer. After one particularly painful knockout, Giganti hung up his boxing gloves and joined the mob instead. He quickly rose through the ranks, and now at age 29, Vito Genovese had given him the most important assignment of his life. On May 2, 1957, after a night out with his wife and friends, Frank Costello returned to his apartment on Central Park West. As he entered the lobby, he heard someone behind him yell his name. It was Giganti. Vincent the Chin pointing straight at Costello with his arms stretched out like this, with a gun in his hand, says, this is for you, Frank, and fires. Had he not said that, he probably would have killed Costello clean away. But by saying that, it caused Costello to turn to see who was speaking to him. As he turned his head, the bullet went under his skin, along the skull, around his head, and lodged over the other ear. Uh, it, it knocked him down to the ground. Uh, the gunman escaped. The 66-year-old Costello was rushed to Roosevelt Hospital, where doctors bandaged his head and sent him home. The publicity was too much for even corrupt New York authorities to ignore. They indicted Vincent Giganti on attempted murder charges. But at the trial, when Frank Costello was called as a key witness, he claimed he could not identify the man who had shot him from point-blank range. Giganti got off scot-free. Some newspaper men who attended that trial claim that as soon as Costello's testimony had concluded, as he walked out of the courtroom, that Giganti walked up to him and said, thanks a lot, Frank. Frank knew he was lucky to be alive, but he had finally had enough of the mob and stepped down as boss. The family's new leader would be Vito Genovese, a man with very different ideas about how to run organized crime. Vito Genovese was a double-dealing, backstabbing, conniving mafia boss who would just as soon shake your hand one minute and kill you the next. Vito's first order of business was to call a top-secret meeting of the commission to explain to the other families why he put a hit on Frank Costello. It would prove to be the worst decision he ever made. By 1957, mob boss Frank Costello had retired. Now, no one stood in the way of Vito Genovese becoming the head of the nation's most powerful crime family.
His first task as boss was to explain to the other families why he had put a hit on Costello. Vito Genovese felt that he had to explain to the members of the commission in other parts of the country uh, that there's new leadership, but it will be business as usual. So he asked for the exceptional meeting. On November 14, 1957, mob leaders from across the United States met in the upstate New York town of Appalachian to hear what the new boss had to say. More than 100 members of the mafia gathered at a country home owned by one of the mobsters, but their presence did not go unnoticed. Officers on patrol in the area happened to spot the fleet of fancy cars parked at the house. They called for roadblocks to be set up to investigate. When the mobsters saw the police coming, some fled into the nearby woods, while others tried to escape in their cars. Sixty of them were arrested on charges of consorting with known criminals. Now, the case was later thrown out of court, but the damage had been done. It was the attention. Big black newspaper headlines, mob summit, mobsters meet. Exactly what the Mafia didn't need. It could be said to be the beginning of the end. Up till that time, many people in law enforcement did not even know that these gangs existed as such. Now a thousand questions were raised. How do these gangsters come together from all over the country? Who calls the meeting? Who sends out the notices? Vito Genovese was blamed and some of his colleagues never forgave him. Still, Genovese was too powerful for the other mob leaders to oust. He had inherited a vast criminal empire that touched virtually every aspect of daily life in New York City. It ran labor unions, the garment district, the waterfront, gambling, prostitution, and garbage collection. It had also stepped up its operations in an increasingly lucrative racket, narcotics. Vito Genovese and uh, those around him saw that as uh, the future of the mob as a cash cow. What Vito didn't understand was it also created a very serious organizational problem for him. As Costello had said, we don't need narcotics because the people will not forgive narcotics. They find out you've been peddling heroin, that's it. It didn't take long for the drug racket to get Vito into trouble. A low-level dealer ratted on him, and in April 1959, the C1-year-old Genovese was charged with conspiracy to import and distribute drugs, a federal crime. He was sentenced to 15 years in a federal prison in Atlanta. His driver, Vincent Giganti, who had shot at Frank Costello two years earlier, was also convicted of narcotics charges and was sentenced to seven years in the same prison. Vito continued to run the family from his cell, with Giganti serving as his apprentice. But even behind bars, Genovese's quick temper got the best of him. In 1963, Genovese began to suspect that his former bodyguard and fellow inmate, Joe Valacci, might be a rat. One day, quite unexpected, Vito Genovese came up to him, hugged him in a bear hug, and then kissed him on both cheeks. Valachi was Sicilian, you knew exactly what that meant. In Sicilian culture, that means kiss of death. Valachi went to the feds and offered to do what no member of La Cosa Nostra had ever done before, go public with its inner workings in exchange for protection. In September 1963, Valachi testified before a Senate committee investigating organized crime. During a nationally televised hearing, he laid out in intricate detail the workings of the Mafia and its five families. This is the way i buy in if I expose this organization. And so for the first time, we had a member of organized crime describing the families, the positions in the families, the National Commission, the name. Cosa Nostra, all of this was blamed on Vito Genovese for not having taken care of Valachi quietly and turning him into an informant of that magnitude. 
Law enforcement soon began publicly referring to each of the five families by the name of its boss at the time. The irony is that Genovese, in whose name the organization was later named, uh, the inheritor of the great criminal tradition of Lucky Luciano and Frank Costello, did more to destroy that heritage than anybody alive. In February 1969, Vito Genovese died in prison of heart failure at the age of 72. Now the family needed new leadership and a lower profile. It would soon find a boss who was a master of both. By the time of Vito Genovese's death in 1969, many of the Mafia's most important secrets had been revealed. Now the family that bore his name needed a leader who was a master at hiding his actions. It turned to one of its more colorful characters to fill the bill. Vincent Chin Giganti was best known as the man who had shot mob boss Frank Costello in 1957. After serving five years in prison on narcotics charges alongside Genovese, he was released in 1964. He left prison with a better understanding of how the family was run and a promise never to return. One thing he certainly learned in prison was that he didn't want to go back to prison. Uh, he learned to cover his tracks. He learned to be much more careful, much more secretive. In 1970, Giganti was charged with attempting to bribe the entire police force of Old Tapan, New Jersey. His defense claimed it was all a big misunderstanding. In November of that year, he gave money to the police force in that city. And his brother said, you know, he's a little bit in need of mental health treatment. He thinks it's getting close to Christmas. You give a tip to the mailman, you give a tip to the garbage collectors. He thought you gave a tip to the policemen, too. The charges were dropped. Giganti had found an effective strategy for staying out of prison. To avoid law enforcement scrutiny began what authorities claim is a long act, and very convincing one, of pretending to be crazy, insane, on the street, you know, talking to parking meters and dogs and claiming they talked back to him. One day when the FBI showed up in his house to serve a subpoena on him, they found him in the bathroom, naked in the shower with an umbrella. It's unclear exactly when Giganti took over as boss of the Genovese family. During much of the 1970s and 80s, the boss was said to be Anthony Fat Tony Salerno. But by the late 1980s, the chin was clearly in charge. Believe me, we tried to get the chin. You couldn't get, he insulated himself so well that you couldn't get to him. He would delegate ten times removed. He was a smart guy. Giganti continued to roam the streets of Greenwich Village, looking more like a mental patient than the head of a large criminal empire. He would usually open commission meetings by, by apologizing for showing up in pajamas and bathrobe. But he said, you know, I got to keep up appearances. The New York press eventually caught on to Giganti's act, dubbing him the Odd Father. There were certain parts of things that just didn't fit. There was the fact that other members of the Genovese crime family were not allowed to speak his name under the pain of death. They were never allowed to say the chin. They could refer to him by pointing to their own chin. Now, if you're not the feared boss of a mafia family, why would other feared members of the mafia be afraid to speak your very name? For more than two decades, Vincent Chin Giganti avoided prosecution by pretending to be insane and he had the medical records to prove it. Giganti would immediately check himself into some psychiatric hospital or another and always managed to convince at least one psychiatrist that he was crazy. And the government would have to get, get their psychiatrist and this, and this went on for years. Then in 1990, the federal government indicted Giganti on racketeering and murder charges including a plot to kill rival mob boss John Gotti. For the next seven years, Giganti's attorneys and the government 
wrangled over his mental state. Some people think he faked it, and he's still faking it. Some people say he faked it, but it actually became true as he got older, and he had strokes, heart attack, and these things can lead to, uh, to, to dementia, uh, to brain damage. In 1996, a federal judge declared Giganti competent to stand trial. A jury found the 69-year-old guilty of racketeering in July of 1997 and sentenced him to 12 years in prison. But mob investigators believe that Giganti continues to run the Genovese family from his cell at the Federal Medical Center in Fort Worth, Texas. The government somehow says Chin Giganti is running the crime family. It's an allegation that's always out there, but it's never been substantiated. Whatever his current role, Giganti represents a last dying link to the Mafia's golden age, before federal prosecution and infighting reduced its power and influence. I would say that Vincent Giganti was of the old school. He was the last of the old-time bosses of New York family. Vincent Giganti was a very, very dedicated uh, man at upholding the oaths of secrecy, the tenants of the mafia. All the murders that Vincent Giganti was charged with have to do with enforcing the rules of the mafia. He only killed people when they broke the rules of La Cosa Nostra. Even with Giganti in prison, the Genovese's remain one of America's most powerful crime families. But the influence of La Cosa Nostra as a whole has diminished over the years. Today's mafia bears only a passing resemblance to the mob of the past, when powerful bosses like Lucky Luciano, Frank Costello, and Vito Genovese ruled New York City and built an empire through violence and corruption. For all timers. Say, it's not like when Lucky was here. Lucky was the guy. Lucky was the man. Lucky knew how to do things. This wouldn't have happened if Lucky was here. There were no young Italian boys in their teens aspiring to be gangsters. They want to go to universities and get their PhDs and doctorates uh, in the professions. Ironically enough, an organization is returning to its roots. It started out as a little street gang with a couple of young punks like Luciano and Genovese and the rest of them who founded organized crime. And now it's going back. It's basically a street gang, just as it started out. In April of 2003, Gigante was indicted again on charges that he controlled the Genovese family from inside his prison cell. Threatened with 10 more years behind bars, Gigante faced the court and pled guilty to obstruction of justice, admitting that his odd father persona was all an act. Vincent Gigante was a cunning faker. And I think those of us in law enforcement always knew that this was an act. A federal judge added three years to his sentence, but the chin would not live to see life on the outside again. On December 19th, Vincent the Chin Gigante, 77, died of heart disease in the federal prison in Springfield, Missouri. The same prison John Gotti died in three years earlier. It was a blow to the Genovese family who, in April 2005, lost their acting boss, Dominic Quiet Dom Cirillo, when he was arrested with three leading members of the family for racketeering and extortion conspiracy. With the death of Gigante regarded by many as last of the old-time bosses, the future of the Genovese family